And we're all excellent. Well, thank you, Fiona and Ben, for your, the opportunity to speak here. It's a real honor. I was really surprised to be asked, so it's, um, hopefully I make the best of the opportunity. Uh, and it's great to actually meet so many of you face to face, as many of you I've spoken to before or, or seen across car parks, in Nikki's case. <laughs> um, yeah, not just randomly waving across car parks at each other. Uh, as Fiona very kindly introduced, I'm a primary teacher up in the wilds of Norfolk where the hobbits still roam. Um, and they do occasionally let us out up into the big cities where Mordor is. Um, but before that, I was an officer in the Royal Navy where I did a lot. I originally drove warships for a living, but then got into the world of quality assurance and talking, sort of going into courses and assessing them and, and changing them, which sometimes was easy and sometimes not so easy. Um, I also do fair amount of writing so if you think hang on I've swim, seen Poirot before up here um, it's because you might have seen me in sort of teach primary or times ed and we've recently just finished our um, our EQM qualification we got a gold which we're very proud of so change that, that big elephant in the room um, and what we're hopefully all going to be delivering after hearing from all our wonderful speakers today and humans we don't like change if you've ever bought a house, bought a car, tried to find a new brand of shampoo, it's not something that we really relish. But as our as subject leaders, as, as curriculum leaders, and that's a word I'm going to be using a lot, leading and leadership, it's how to make the best of that, how to turn that, that, that risk, that change, into a chance, <laughs> into an opportunity. And that's really what I'm focusing on. We've had our wonderful speakers ahead of me that have spoken huge amounts about the ideas, about the curriculums that we can bring to weight from those ideas. And the whys and the whats, and, and my, what I'm talking about now is, is the hows, how we bring that in. So ironically, at an RE conference symposium, I'm not going to be talking about RE from pretty much all of this, <laughs> other than a, a few sort of anecdotes of, of my own along the way. So before we get into how we deliver change, let's deal with some of those other elephants in the room of why staff don't want to change. And probably the big one, and it can be with new curriculums or just trying out that new bottle of shampoo, is that fear of the unknown. Um, what's gonna happen, the ifs. Equally, we've got the, the, that fear, uh, that loss of security that can come with that. I, I, I like the old jumper. I know it's got three holes in it, but it fits really well. I don't want to buy the new one, it won't fit properly. Within curriculums though, and, and Ben referenced this before, we can have that loss of power or that loss of assume, sort of uh, perceived power. We, we've, we emotionally invest in these curriculums as do our teachers who work with us and work for us. And people can feel that loss of status. And, and often when there's the great squeak of the dragging of heels when you're trying to change something, that can be one. Humans are, have massive egos, regardless of how humble we, we try and be. Um, or equally, it's just habit. There might be that you, you love teaching, because the kids always love it, they have lots of good fun. Are they really learning anything? But it's always fun to do, it's always that one, and we just do them out of habit. The three that I've sort of put there in bold are the ones in schools that come up so often. When, we're, when I've led projects or tried to sort of advise on projects, people not seeing the reason for change, and which I'm going to talk more about in a minute, or if they have seen the reason for change, they then can't understand how to realise that. They, they can see that opportunity, that chance, but then they don't know how to realise it. Or one which we've probably all come up against when you've sat there with that budget spreadsheet in front of you, lack of resourcing. Um, where we can sometimes be a bit creative with, and I'm going to touch on that uh, a bit later. But I've generally found if you have a staff where they are, with a well-explained reason for change, with solid information, with, with good resourcing, they can get to grips with huge projects. Uh, at my school, we started rolling out our Religion and Worldviews curriculum at the beginning of 2019, and I had this wonderful three-year plan. Boy, that went off the rails quick. Um, but I, according to my staff, I don't know if they were trying to flatter me, they really understood our rationale, what we were trying to do, that we were trying to get children to have those well-informed conversations about religion and worldviews. They understood the underpinning ideas, the underpinning visions of what we were trying to achieve. They had a bank of knowledge to call upon. They had resources at hand. So when suddenly the world went the way it did, 
they could carry on delivering that change. We could still work in it. And our, our pupils and our parents were very supportive and really enjoyed doing some of those lessons as well. I, I might have thought RE was one of the ones that might have fallen, or religion and worldviews as we changed the name to, might have fallen off during home learning, but we were able to keep it going and delivering new content and new lessons because staff really understood what they were doing. Let's talk a bit more about people. Um, you may have seen this model a few times or, or not. It's actually from the tech world, uh, this, from a chap called Rogers, and it's about how people, he was looking at how people adapted to new forms of technology, but you can equally apply it to new ideas, and there's a thinker we're going to look at on the next slide who did. Um, and that's where I really want to, I'm going to keep going back to, is staff and people, those people that are delivering that change on our behalf, sometimes get overlooked in some of the wider conversations about when we're talking about children and their learning, but actually it's, it's the staff that are going to be delivering that change for you. Um, and people are messy, as you might have known. Imagine, you know, you had those debates about getting biscuits in the staff room. Imagine talking about sort of changing new curriculum. When we talk about uh, any new ideas, you've got your, your innovators, which is kind of us giving up our time, come away from home to really get to grips with something new and shiny. And generally, the majority of your staff are going to be your early adopters, your early majority. They're going to see those innovators getting excited about something. And they're like, you know what? This is like a good idea. I'm going to go with it. You then got your, your later majority who they might need a bit of training, a bit of support to bring on those ideas. But you know what? They're, like, they're generally like a lot of teachers. We don't do this job for the paycheck. We do it because we like it and we, we're enthused about learning. And they can be helped along through, through coaching and, and training. The one, when I've led projects and had helped on projects, the one that is going to be the biggest pain in the neck are your laggards. They're those last few. They are those dissenting voices. They're the ones that have had their egos punctured or the, the ones that just don't like you for some reason because humans are like that. They might, I don't know, maybe you used their mug once and you know, they've held it against you forevermore. They're the ones that you almost need to risk assess how that person you know, the one who will derail your wonderfully planned project through a few snide comments over a cup of tea, one, you know, one, one break time when you're on duty. How are you going to plan for them? What might be those questions they come up with to try and trip you up? Um, and again, it's, it's, then you can maintain the, their professionalism and keeping things sort of smoothly running. Um, I had that on a project in the Navy. Our biggest stumbling block, ironically, was one of the very senior officers in charge who just did not want to change um, due to long-held reasons they had. So we, we planned around them. We helped, we really had to spend a lot of time nurturing them and getting them to see that reason for change. But ultimately that was then led to a huge success that went along. Moving on from that model, we've got a lovely addition to it by Geoffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm. It's a book he did. And he was looking at sort of people's enthusiasm over time. So what I didn't explain on the previous slide was you've kind of got running along the bottom is time. So your innovators will jump on at the beginning. Your laggards will be sort of the last to adopt it. And he very much looked at the emotional weight people had. So at the beginning, your, your innovators, your early adopters, they're going to be absolutely full of excitement for these ideas. They may or may not then realise that. And I'm going to talk more about this later, but how do we fill that chasm? How do you keep the momentum going when that initial excitement is out of the way and people are getting to grips with what they're doing? Um, and that's one to really kind of plan for and, and think about as you go along. So how do we plan for change? Um, there's various models out. The one that we used in the Navy and I've adapted over a time is one by John Cotter. Um, originally published many years ago and he's updated and revised it and his books are really worth reading. They're very much aimed at the business world. We as teachers are not dealing with our Tuesday afternoon team meetings and our TPS reports and um, you know our quarterly profit margins but he has, he's, a, he's a good thinker and it's like we found today getting outside of our bubbles is really helpful to learn about and on the copy of the slides that Fiona will hand out, uh, send out afterwards there's sort of more on his um, model. There's kind of eight steps, stages, but they're not kind of a tick list. Some are main gates that you would go through. Others are more things that you will do, you'll start doing and then keep doing as you go along. And it's 
one to sort of think about equally as teachers we're not working within a hierarchical structure so we need to be aware of how we guide people along because most of us work in isolation um, and as will our, their, our staff they won't have you, you won't be there sort of looking over their shoulder and keeping these reforms going all the time so let's get into the kind of the meat of how to <coughs> deliver change oh good i'm running to time um the very very first thing is why are we doing this change what's what's the point is often the really important thing is this just change for change's sake um what what's been the thinking that's led up to this change what's the new needs within your community within the, the subject that's brought that out and to use an often overused words is it authentic what's your own personal motivation coming back to what Catherine said about sort of personal worldviews at the back of your mind are you thinking this is going to be a great way to to nail down that UPS3 pay rise I've been after or is this going to actually be a betterment for the school maybe it's both but it's about again having that sort of self-reflection on why we're doing it for us in the room we've had the the core report we've had the, the Ofsted research review we've had publications from Cullum St Gabriel's from Theos that are all feeding into our thinking uh, I in Norfolk we've got our new locally agreed syllabus which has really driven my thinking within our our recurriculum the change um, that we've led from in there when I, one of the projects worked in the Navy it was we suddenly had a school we worked with suddenly had a massive drop in their pass rate and we're like, well, why why has this happened we then went in and did some investigation and, and there'd been a fundamental change in the way that navigation was taught or rather how it was done at sea hadn't been reflected at the school that's why the pass rate had dropped it was costing the navy about two and a half million pounds a year so we need that was our rationale we needed to update the training to reflect the current frontline environment and also you know save the navy some money in the process nice picture there do you like a bit of the old uh, victorian history um probably explains my dress sense um it this is sort of what you're doing as you're getting going it's trying to build your little team of pioneers those people that you know that you can call upon to lend you a hand who are your friends professional allies at school or maybe outside of in other schools that can help you out before you bring your project to the wider school community who are they? they're going to be your your road testers your little own sort of private team of innovators that you can give a little sneak peek you can read into this great project you've got before the rest of the world gets hold of it to use the technical uh, technology world parlance this is all your beta testers um, and they're the people that you can get out working on stuff early you can do a, a soft launch which is what I'm going to talk about more in a second but they're really helpful at you seeing your own blind spots um, they have basically allowed you to make all sorts of mistakes in private um, project we recently did in my school on generative learning uh, which I've written about in um, other publications. I worked with a key stage one member of staff because I did teach training with her and she's really nice. Um, and, but she was really helpful because I've only ever taught year five and six. I'm used to working with you know, sort of nine, 10, 11 year olds. And she's used to working with five, six, seven year olds. And there's, there was a whole world down there that I knew nothing about. But yeah, I said, this is what I want to do. Here's my vision. This is how I kind of think it's going to work. Here's this thing I've made. Please go and break it. And she took it down and adjusted it and came back with some wonderful feedback, which then actually fed into how we were going to then support our low prior attaining and SEN pupils in key stage two. And it led to a much better product, far more, far better than anything I'd envisioned. But it was helpful because we'd done that quietly before everyone else got to have a look at it. And I, it certainly in one of my thinkings, there was a fundamental flaw, which thankfully we kind of, we dealt with and swept away. I'm really, as I've already covered there, soft launching is great it gets starts getting the word out on what you're doing quietly teachers are nosy hang on what are they doing in that classroom why what's that shiny new you know resource they're using and it lets you make those mistakes and also those laggards i mentioned earlier when they're like sitting at the back well what about what about what about what about you've already answered those questions because you've already had to go you've knocked the rust off you've knocked the corners off and you've really got a solid starting point before you ever get going and I could talk quite a lot about soft launching there's a lot of research out there that's really worth looking at again from the business world um, Apple are quite good at it as our Facebook 
they're quite good at, um, if you've ever been on Facebook and then suddenly something it was doing it isn't doing anymore, it's because they soft launch algorithms and trials in the background without telling you. They might release it to just a few thousand users to see what happens and then they take it away again. Um, so they're very good at it. As did Twitter with being able to edit tweets, but that hasn't found its way to us yet. Another point as you get going, but then one that you, I would strongly advise in the, if it's the only thing you take away from this, this is the one to take away, is to start writing. To write everything down, to codify that vision, to nail down your practicalities. It, it, at the heart of so many team-based activities is communication. If you, you can't communicate too much and too often, except you might get people turning off their alerts and their emails or sending your emails to spam, but um, it helps people know what they're doing. So if you get writing, you, you write everything down, you put it all in one document that you can link to and update to as you go and keep refining it. I think our, our, e -curricula, our religion and worldviews curriculum is on about draft nine, I think. Um, but it started as a blank Word document one day back in the depths of 2019. And there it was with a blank sheet of paper saying at the time, religious education curriculum, which then about 18 months later got deleted and changed to religion and worldviews curriculum. But that is where you can keep going. So every time you reach the next stage of your project, email people about it, hold a meeting and then email it about to them again. Keep bugging them, keep telling them what you're doing and write it down and sweat all those small details. That question someone asks you on, in the staff room and you think, oh yeah, actually that's, that's a really good point. Go back and chuck it in. And I very much make my staff aware that our curriculum documentation is a, we're still running the race to steal the, someone else's quote earlier on. Um, and you need to keep changing it and updating it and they will find updates. And I push things out saying, I've changed something on page 12, go and you know, please go and read it. And, Hopefully some of them do. I mean, our religion and worldviews curriculum is now something like 40 pages long and 12,000 words. It wasn't. Originally, it was six words and one sheet of paper. But it's because we've invested the time, we've grown it, we've kept coming back to it. Staff have added to it over time to really fill that in. And within that document, we've got everything in one place. Our overview maps, our pedagogy, our language, and how we say, you know, we refer to some Christians or most Muslims or some Hindus the tiny minutia and it's all in there so when we have new members of staff join they say how do you do religion and worldviews re i can go there you go that's that piece of paper there's all the curricular maps for every single year group it's all in there how everything integrates how the learning in year one feeds into two and three and four and five and six and they can see that whole journey they might not be relevant to you and they might only look at it once or flick through and think what a horrible shade of orange to represent theology because you couldn't get the right one off the Norfolk agreed syllabus but it's still there. They can refer back to it should they have a question. So yeah, I think I've probably said the word writing enough now. We can move on. Um, this is then the bit when you're actually going to launch. And this is where you want to get people working. Um, it's a trial run. It's a trial launch. You've had your soft launch. Now this is going to be your first launch in effect. And it, it's a practice run. You're getting people working. It's not going to be the finished article. You may well, the thing you do in the trial run then goes in the bin, and often it does. But that's the point. What's good is, is it gets people working, and then you as the leader can go, what did I miss? What do people know? What do people not know? Where's the training? What resources have they not got? What did I just completely get wrong when I was planning this? But this is where you can you need to start handing off. You've gone from riding the bicycle yourself to sticking someone on it and holding the back of the seat. And you can encourage feedback from staff. And because they know it's a trial run, they're gonna be a lot more bold in their feedback, because you know, at least if they're polite and kind members of staff, they know that you're not as quite as emotionally invested in this as um, the kind of finished article. And this again is where you can keep doing your writing and your feeding in and adding and shaping which is really, I love that quote there. I believe it's from Steve Jobs about moving fast and breaking things. You've set your vision, you've communicated what you want to, you've, you've kind of said where we're going from and where we're going to, which is using that bike analogy, down the, you know, the long way down the park path. And then you can let staff run with it. 
and they can then start feeding in especially at primary you're, you won't have that wide enough field of view to see it for every age group and that's where it can be really helpful to actively encourage that feedback cycle on that trial unit that trial piece of work that people have been working on and that's one that really flags up when we started our religion and worldviews curriculum primary teachers don't know how to teach geology funnily enough most of us have you know, we've got degrees in art and architecture and leadership if you're my case none of us had a background in theology so that was really helpful for us to go start any training and then we could start working out the specifics of that training as people have got working you can start removing those barriers training being one of them it might be training it might be knowledge and the one i've found with so many projects is this is where you start spending your money on your staff start buying them books start buying them the training if that training doesn't exist find someone cleverer than you and ask them to go and make it um, in our case when, with our theology training we couldn't find any in norfolk thankfully our school vicar used to be an re teacher and he was immensely helpful i went to reverend derrick and went i'd like this is what my staff need to know and i'm not clever enough to tell them so what do they need to know here's all my questions and he sat and we built a number of staff meetings and put them together and to start meeting the needs of the staff um, and that's where we've really invested and that's kind of come from kind of those as i mentioned earlier in the previous step because you've done that trial unit and everyone's had a go because they know it's a trial unit they don't mind admitting that it didn't go very well because they didn't know what they were doing or that they need more help with something or more coaching or they need more resources um, and one thing that I've sort of seen with other projects is there's no point buying the shiny toys for the for the children for, the, for your students that shiny new resource if the staff don't know how to use them uh, primary computing and primary science are particularly bad for that we buy all these amazing you know experiment kits for the, for the children to use and the staff have no idea how they integrate into their curriculum and they so they sit there gathering dust in their nice shiny packaging never never used or they're only used once and then this is where we're kind of then getting into the the full launch of your project so everyone, we've had a trial run you had your soft launch your trial run you've spent email after email boring people senseless with all this excitement you've got about your new shiny project and then this is kind of the hard bit when you need to start getting going so this is where you're going to be getting staff to work on their first units their first proper attempt at building something and this needs planning for how are you going to let people know they've succeeded a um, bit like we do with the children really yeah you have almost some or whichever differentiation you, you choose to use but how are people going to measure themselves if they've succeeded or equally how are they going to know when to come to you and say i don't know if i'm doing this right or how are they going to know when to come to you and say look what i did it's brilliant you know and, and share their excitement and it's where you can build a bridge over that chasm which i mentioned right back at the beginning of the of my slides you've thought about where the en people's energies and enthusiasm is dropping off and you're going to how you're going to bridge that how you're going to stop the project getting derailed by a, a loss of enthusiasm and that feedback is going to become self-perpetuating as people feed back in you can shape it gives it renews the energy and also stops those moaning laggards who are saying this still isn't going to work don't see how this is going to work okay well actually look it's working or yeah i can appreciate your point of view but look yet yeah, that problem you've come to me with so you know a few other members of staff and here was the answer i gave them and that can be really helpful as well the one to be mindful of is that it's a a real win it's not just fluff or it's not just a sort of a, a superficial view that you've succeeded because then it's a bit like building a bridge out of you know spaghetti and marshmallows as opposed to steel you staff's enthusiasm will plummet and then trying to then you know your project by that point is on life support um, and you're, it's going to take a huge amount of effort and energy to try and bring it on and it's also to carry on with that really bad bicycle analogy i was using earlier this is kind of the point where you're letting go of the back of the seat you know that you've got everyone pointing hopefully in the right direction and they've not crashed into a tree and you can let them run with it and it's as a leader that's when you're taking a step back and can kind of be the most terrifying part because you've suddenly gone this thing i've been investing all my time and energy and bugging my poor wife with incessantly poor woman um that 
they've now someone else is going to go and play with it. It's like that nice shiny toy you took into school and now you're letting someone else play with it. And <coughs> it's letting people make their own mistakes, but then also feeding that back in to help everyone. Um, and it's one, as, particularly as primary teachers, the idea of letting go of it can be unusual or quite difficult to, um, to think about. It's also a time to celebrate. It's one that I've been very mindful of, of when people bring you the idea they've done really well, you let everyone else know and you say who did it. Look what year five did. That, that, that creation lesson they did was absolutely brilliant. The, the linking they did between the, the Christian, the Viking and the Dharmic creation story is absolutely fantastic. Or you know that work he afforded on, on philosophy and getting into the discussion, sort of weighing up the discussions of evil and suffering. Didn't expect that with eight year olds, oh, that was amazing. One also to be mindful of though is you're not accidentally playing favourites because boy will people notice if you say how well year four have done it and have forgotten to you know, reference something. To the point I actually have, I keep a little log of it just to make sure that I'm not overly praising one year group. But also it's helpful, it covers your blind spots. Is that that year group you just don't see because you have conflicting break duties so you never have those conversations with them. It goes back to people are messy. Now if they feel like they're being overlooked, they're, they're gonna grumble. They're really that they're going to go from being one of your early adopters to one of your laggards very quickly because they're going to feel personally offended. Um, so yeah, really one to sell it, get that celebration. Also, biscuits really help when it's the fifth staff meeting you've had on RE and it's you know your five half terms in and people are wondering why you keep stealing all the time on the uh, staff meeting schedule. And then this is kind of the trickiest bit: how you are going to plan to sustain the change. So. The first six stages you've probably covered a half term, a term. Now we're talking how are we going to sustain that change over the next year, two years, three years? How are you going to keep it running? And that's one that needs planning for. Where are you going to check in with staff? When are you not going to check in with staff? One, where are the bits you're still not happy with? In our curriculum, even three years in, we're still not happy with assessment. We need to come back to it but it's one I planned for, because I knew if I tried to do pedagogy, new subject knowledge, new structures, and how to assess it all at once, I would have got things thrown at me. So I had already planned for, but you've got an answer. So when my head or Siams or Ofsted said, you know, let's talk at you about assessment, I can go, well, you know what, it's not, this is what we're doing, I'm not happy with it. It's where we're going to, but I need staff to have done some teaching first before they can really get to grips with how to assess it but I, that's planned in, that was within that three year plan of getting our project off the ground and getting staff really settled about it. And it's then about the celebration again, a, a line I completely stole from an old commanding officer of mine was send out good news, deliver bad news. So if, pe if you've seen something someone's doing and you really like it, send them an email. So then in amongst all those you know, whinges about break time timetables and complaints from parents, they've got something nice. And if you have to, need to have difficult conversations about things maybe not going so well in that long term, go and knock on their door. Because if nothing else, you, know, you can pick your moment. If you really want to annoy someone, send them that email that you need to talk about their books with them when they've just had, you know, had kids shouting at them for half an hour because it's been a wet break time. And that's one where, again, it's taking on that leadership mantle and trying to... Uh, lead that change through there which is easier said than done because we don't like to, it's giving people bad news and then we reach the last stage how the the sort of the new then becomes the normal how you know when to step back and monitor and really you're, you keep celebrating you keeping keeping your coaching going how all those initial meetings that we talked about sort of way back in step four and step step six maybe now just become monthly or termly or even sort of you know just once or twice a year to check in to update people on what they need to know and this is a time when your own energies might be flagging but you need to keep those emails going that you're celebrating what people are doing keeping the good news coming in and then you can start blogging and tweeting and writing and sharing with other communities and pretty much then go right back to the beginning this is what we've done now is it the best it could be what can we do to make it even better and one thing we found was the RE quality mark process that was really helpful for us to get someone in to look at what we'd done who didn't who hadn't spent the last three years having emails from me talking about the RE quality mark I found that was really really helpful um, so that's it for me so 
thank you for uh, listening and I hope you found it really helpful. Um, and I have written a lot more about change management and leadership um, over the time on my website as well, which has got lots of my other articles or if you'd like to talk further, my, um, you can reach me there. So thank you very much.